Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingston, Texas, USA, with episode number two of the Talmud Exposed Underlight with Lon, the man Cherry Holmes. <laughs> Welcome back to the studio, my dear brother in crime. Brother in arms, brother in crime. Hi, how, how do you say that? What do you call it when you say that? It's a figure of speech. Partner in crime. Par- partners in crime. There we go. There we go. So uh, yeah. So last week was actually really cool. It was a good. It was uh, very important information we discussed. It was very much a, a hit in my books, even if no one else liked it, because <laughs> I'm your biggest fan. Oh, thanks. So, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, for those tuning in for the first time, uh, you can see in the beginning of episode one, you'll be able to see a, a brief. Uh, I kind of put his testimony out there for you on things I thought you would find important. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so if you're kind of curious about this guy, but one thing we'll discuss uh, just on, on the entry is um, he, he studied his uh, Talmudic teachings through his rabbis in, in Dallas and Jerusalem. Where were you in? Tel Aviv. Uh, tel- oh, I'm sorry, in Tel Aviv? Yeah, I studied at the uh, University uh, Beit Midrash program for five years straight. Okay. We studied uh, two nights a week. And we covered about seven or eight of the tractates of the Talmud, as well as uh, very uh, specific portions as well. And it was all under an orthodox context. And so, and I remain to this day to be a studier of Talmud. I attend two Talmudic classes a week, uh, one on tractate Sanhedrin and the other on tractate Yoma, uh, which are the two, tr- there are two tractates. Tractate Sanhedrin's about the court systems and the jurisprudence uh, of Jewish law. And uh, Tractate Yoma is about the, the entire ceremony of Yom Kippur. And we've been studying these for years. So, Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's good to have you back here in the studio. And those for the times that you're not able to come, because you have about eight shows we've got lined up, right? Yeah, I have Seven nine episode plans. Okay. Ready. And okay. And so uh, most of those, unfortunately, may wind up being on Skype unless I can get you to come down here once a month. Oh, I don't know. I don't live too far <laughs> away from you. So, uh, yeah. So there you go. So with, uh, with that being said, I guess we can get this thing kicked off. And um, got the Bible up there if we need to ro- rotate back. And we're fixing to pull up your... Right. So the first okay. thing I want to do is uh, on YouTube, uh, two weeks ago when we did our last broadcast, some people had some comments in mm. YouTube. And one of the comments was is that the last 20 minutes was rambling and they didn't understand the point. Oh. So I want to go back to the last lecture and okay. re-clarify some things. Okay, okay cool. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. So let's do Sounds that good. real quick. All right, go ahead. You got to pull up your word? Yeah, it's already up. Okay, got it. Okay, as you can see at the top, it says clarification from the last lecture. Okay, so last time, uh, this is a story. Uh, you should review it. If you haven't seen it, just go back now and look at it. Or don't, don't go back now. <laughs> Go back later and look at it. But we want you to see it live. Um, There was a whole thing about a rabbi trying to do miracles to prove his point. And at the very end, uh, a voice from heaven comes down and says that this rabbi is correct. And uh, Rabbi Joshua, he gets up and he says, uh, it is not in heaven. And what he's talking about is the Torah is not in heaven. Okay. Um, But the thing that wasn't clear to people was the last part because um, uh, Rabbi Jeremiah said that the Torah had already been given at Mount Sinai. We pay no attention to a heavenly voice because you have long since written in the Torah at Mount Sinai, be after the majority to incline. So the question is, is what's the explanation of this? Because um, at first I introduced the fact that it's a misquotation. and so as you can see in Exodus chapter 23, verse 2, it says, Do not be after the majority mm-hmm. to do evil. Right, right. And do not testify <laughs> in a case to incline after the majority to tip the scales of justice. So, um, so if Rabbi Jeremiah is quoting the scripture to say that we should follow the majority, then he's making a mistake. It would seem, by quoting this verse, that says, Do not go after the majority. Now, if this indeed is the correct translation of the verse then what Rabbi Jeremiah is trying to say is that we go after the majority to do good. But when the majority goes out to do bad, we do not follow them. So he's using a homiletic technique. He says, oh, the scripture says do not go after a majority when they're out to do evil. Us, the rabbis here, are actually trying to do a good thing by obeying Torah. Okay. 
But then at the very end of the lecture, I brought forth some passages from Tractate Sanhedrin that says that actually that is not the only possible translation of this verse from Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. Um, because that translation would be two negative commandments. Okay, do not be after a majority and do not testify, right? However, in the Torah scroll, there are no punctuation marks. Right. There are no vowel markings either. And you can parse a verse uh, any way you want, as long as it makes sense. And so actually it ends up that in the Talmud, they lean heavily on the second possible translation of this verse, which could be divided into three parts. The first part being, do not go after a mere majority to convict. They're using, instead of using the word evil, it's using the word convict. Um, do not testify after a master to incline, which means you're not allowed to voice your opinion after the head judge has voiced his opinion. The head judge has to go last. And then the third part would actually be a positive commandment. So it was negative, negative, and now positive. Go after the majority to incline for an acquittal. Hmm, now, if right. this indeed is the translation of Exodus 23 verse 2, you cannot claim that Rabbi Jeremiah is misquoting it. He's just quoting the part that can be separated from the previous two parts. Be after a majority to incline. Meaning, in cases of dispute where there is a debate and there is no clear answer, we're just going to go by the majority. Okay? Does that clear up that? Sure. That makes sense. That makes so, sense. So that, just, that was a very good question on YouTube, and I uh, wanted to clarify it. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Okay, cool. So <coughs> now for the juicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think um, this is one of the craziest accusations that I've ever seen of the Talmud. <laughs> it's one of the very first ones I heard. You could probably tell a story it, about how you heard it. Too. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually heard this, uh, and I won't mention the name, but I heard it from a Messianic friend. Um, who was, um, you know, the fulfilled, I hate to say this, but the fulfilled Jews or like, you know, whatever you want to call it. But but they were actually, I say they because there was more than one person, but one in particular I have in mind. But they had asked me, how can you possibly uh, lean towards the oral Torah uh, whenever there's such like like vile claims against it? And I was like, like what? And then he mentioned this this one. And I was thinking my very first gut reaction would be like, it would be like it is with my wife. I love my, if somebody said something negative about my wife, my first gut reaction would not be like, oh, good, now I've got something against him. I'd be like, You're, you've got to be misunderstanding something. So it shocks me how so many people, Christian and Messianic alike, are so quick to say, yay, we found something else negative about the oral law. That really confuses me because... I would never do that to, to anybody. I mean, you, you really want to give somebody the benefit of the doubt altogether, especially in this in this case. And so my response was the same way. I was like, no, that's got to be, something's got to be wrong with the source or with, with the story. Something's missing. He's, oh, no, off, off. And he showed it to me. And, of course, I didn't know to proof uh, websites and things like this. But I was like, wow, it really says this. And I was like, I was completely amazed. And so I hung up that day uh, uh, with, with talking with him on the phone, and I immediately called Lon. <laughs> and fortunately, he had already he had already discussed this and studied studied this out with his rabbi. And uh, and I was like, so finally, when I called him back, he actually didn't want to hear it. He was like, because it, it was I almost got that feeling from him, like, oh man, I thought I had one on him. That it, and I know that's really heartbreaking. It's heart wrenching, but many people feel this way. So one of you do have a defense statement against it. They don't want to hear it. They enjoy having these negative claims against the Talmud. And it, it's, it's, it's shocking to me. It really, really is. So with that said, so lead on. So I just said, let's start with the moral high ground. Okay, mm -hmm. let's not try to just defend the Talmud. Let's just, let's just see what Judaism says about sexual morality. Okay, what does it say about prostitution and pedophilia, which will be most of the claims against the Talmud? See, these claims are going to say that the Talmud condones pedophilia, that the Talmud condones sleeping with prostitutes, and all sorts of crazy claims like that. Let's just see what Judaism believes, okay? So with that, we have Rambam and uh, Mishneh Torah, Hilchot Ishut, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, Ishut means marriage. So Rambam okay. opens up his whole section about marriage here, okay? So would you please read? Okay. Uh, before the giving of the Torah, if a man meets a woman in the marketplace, if they both consent, he gives her pay and has intercourse with her and goes, goes his way. 
that is what is known as harlotry. From the moment that the Torah was given, harlotry was forbidden, for it says, There shall not be a harlot among the daughters of Israel, Deuteronomy 23.18. Therefore, anyone who has relations with the woman for the sake of promiscuity out of wedlock is deviating from the Torah. Okay, so it's a very clear statement by one of the largest uh, post-scheme in Judaism, one of the largest law decisors in, uh, in Judaism. It says that, uh, I mean, the Torah says it. Prostitution right. is forbidden all the way. And what is prostitution? That's when you pay someone to have sex. Mm. Okay? Forbidden all the way. The only time you can pay to have sex in Judaism is when you're paying the dowry for your wife. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's it. Okay. Have me worried here for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's funny. Okay. And, so that's the first claim. So <clears throat> how you can see here we have a clear statement. Everything else you're going to see is going to be a miscontext, a misquotation. Okay? All right. Now, what does the Talmud say about pedophilia? And we're going to see here in the next thing that pedophil pedophilia uh, is forbidden. Okay. Uh, Kiddushin 41a. A man may give his daughter's hand in betrothal when she is a young lady only when she is a young lady, but not when she is a little girl. This supports the teaching of of uh, Rav. Of Rav. Uh, for Rabbi Judah said, In the name of Rav, one is forbidden to give his daughter a hand in betrothal when she is a little girl, only when she grows up and is able to consent, saying, I want so-and-so. Okay, so this passage already says a lot about a couple of things. Right. First of all, uh, in order for a woman to be eligible to be married, okay, uh, she has to have hit puberty at the least. Minimum. Okay. Right. Minimum. Second of all... Now, did you clarify the claim, the specific claim, as to why that is different than what we're talking about? The three-year-old thingy. Well, I haven't brought the claim yet. I wanted okay. to start on what okay. the Talmud actually says oh, okay. so that when oh, we look yeah, yeah, at yeah. these okay. false so, accusations, they look ridiculous. So this particular one is in reflection to that three-year-old claim. So a minimum, yeah. minimum of puberty, well, 12, 12 years old, right, right. a bat mitzvah age... Uh, just the actual halakhic requirement is that they have to have pubic hair. Okay, that's the minimum, right? And so you, anything below that is pedophilia by definition. The, mm -hmm. Most people think pedophilia means uh, having uh, relations with someone under the age of 18. Is That's, not the, that's mm -hmm. not the correct definition of pedophilia. Pedophilia is having relations with somebody who is prepubescent. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. there's another word for... Uh, love of teenagers and uh, you know post pubescent youth right, gotcha. I forget I think it's ephebophilia or something along those lines I don't remember but uh, as you can see here that it notice the word forbidden for a father to mm -hmm. give his daughter before she's reached that age and the second most important thing that comes from this is what's the most important thing for marriage consent mm -hmm. right the girl has to be of consenting age. And you know where they learned that from? Hmm. Rebecca okay. and Isaac. Right. When uh, the servant of Abraham, uh, Eliezer, went to Levon and their father uh, Bethuel, uh, they actually, there's a verse where they ask uh, Rebecca if she wants to go with the servant so that she can marry Isaac. So right. from that, the rabbis <laughs> learned that consent is a must for any marriage. There is no forced marriage right. upon anybody in Judaism. There, uh, even if it's an arranged marriage, it's only through the consent. Right. I mean, the father and mother can arrange all they want, but the moment that the girl says, I don't like this guy, it's over. But what about tradition? Uh, well, that's actually, there you go. You can see through that very uh, movie that her father did not give her hand in marriage to the the butcher. Right. He refused it. Yeah. Because she would not consent. Right. Right. So, that I think does that makes it clear, Clip? Definitely. Definitely. So here's what you'll see on the internet. Okay, and you're gonna see things like this most of the time. It's gonna have the source, the page number, and what side of the page. Okay, this is standard quotation of the Talmud. Now, 20 years ago, a lot of these would go around on the internet, they would be wrong, but in the last, you know, five or 10 years, they've been correcting them. Where do you find these things? You find them on anti-Semitic websites. You can find these things on the Ku Klux Klan's website. You can find these things even on Messianic websites, who I think are not doing it 
on purpose. They don't realize that they're quoting anti-Semites here. Gotcha. And most <laughs> of these claims come from a, uh, a book called The Truth About the Talmud. Now, I would like to give credit to um, a username on the internet. His name is Gil Student, and he made a website 20 years ago. It's a very old website. It's like Angel Fire. Which means it's a really old website. Okay. Uh, where he, when these claims started coming out, when the internet started existing, uh, he refutes them one by one, and the name of that website is called the Real Truth About the Talmud. Okay. Nice. So the book that came out against this, you know, written by a man named Michael A. Hoffman II, uh, the Truth About the Talmud, uh, his website by Gil Student uh, counteracts most of the claims. And so let's, let's look at some of these ridiculous claims. Okay. Um, first of all, I brought this one. This has nothing to do with pedophilia. Um, Bava Matsya 59b. Okay, this is what they say. A rabbi debates God and defeats him. <laughs> God admits that the uh, rabbi won the debate. Okay, does that sound familiar? That, that, that thing right there? I don't know. Rabbi debates God and defeats him. And God admits the rabbi won the debate, don't you? That's what we studied last time. That's Achnai's oven story. Oh. So oh. you see how oh, well they're... Oh, God admits the rabbi won the debate. You see how they're quoting... I didn't know that that was how... That's how oh, they quote really? it. Oh, really? Oh, no These way. are not quotations. These are accusations. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. So this first accusation that a rabbi debates God and defeats right, him... Right, We spent an hour and 20 minutes on that in my last lecture. Look it up. Yeah. That's not what the story's about at all. The story is about uh, how we interpret text, you know, that have been given down thousands of years ago, that the original tent of God got lost, and therefore we we are stuck with uh, using interpretational means. We don't listen to voices from God. There is no debate with God. There's only debate amongst scholars. Okay, so. As you can see, the accusation is an oversimplification mm -hmm, right. of, of that. Okay, so that's the first one. Okay. So I thought that's pretty funny, right? Yeah, that is pretty wild. Yeah. Okay, now this one is actually a quotation. It says in Ketubot 11b, when a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. Okay. What does it sound like, William? It sounds exactly like pedophilia, rape, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I know. It like sounds... the worst of worst. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and the man gets off scot free. That's what it looks like. It's it's designed to protect the guy. That's what it looks like. Right. So, we will see that that claim is utterly ridiculous. Actually, I already shown you that it's ridiculous because we looked at what uh, the what the Chalmud actually says about you know yeah. relations with just Hebrew before these. Yep. Okay. Uh, Moed Katan seventeen a. I got this one from a. There's a pastor missionary in Israel who uh, confronted me about this one. He says, did you know that your Talmud that you're trying to teach me says that uh, you can do evil as long as you do it far away? Because it says in uh, Moed Katan 17a, if a Jew is tempted to do evil, he should go to a city where he is not known and do the evil there. Okay, what does that mean? There's something a little bit more deep about that. And then the next claim we're going to talk about is from Abu Dazara. Uh, 17a. I mean, it looks like all these accusations are on 17a for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the rabbis pick 17a to be the most controversial page of the book. No. That's funny. No, I'm just kidding around. So it states that, that there is not a, a whore in the world that the Talmudic sage Rabbi Elazar had not had sex with. Okay. All right. So now we can see that the rabbis don't even obey their own law. Okay. okay. We're going to see that story completely different than what you might think it might mean. And then the last claim we'll deal with today is Yebamoth 59b. Uh, a woman who had intercourse with the beast is eligible to marry a Jewish priest. A woman who has had sex with a demon is also eligible to marry a Jewish priest. Okay, we'll look at that, see it in its context, and then we'll understand what it's talking about. Interesting. I've never heard the last one. I've, I've heard all of them but that last one. I know. That's, that's really crazy. Pretty Keep in mind, these are all accusations, not... Right. Yeah, not... We are going to go okay. one by one and refute them. Now, I just think it's funny that... It seems like everything on their side is based on misquotations. Mm -hmm. If it's not just, they're going to support their faith by misquotations, right. and then they're going to attack our faith by misquotations. Right, right, right. Don't you see that pattern that's, there? That's, yeah, that's pretty awful. Very dishonest, to say the least. Very dishonest. 
Okay. All right, let's start with the, the craziest claim first. Does the, uh, does the Talmud condone pedophilia, okay? So here's the claim. Uh, when a grown-up <coughs> man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. Okay, as you can see, I've highlighted the text, and that is actually a quotation from the Talmud. Now, we're going to look at the full context, starting with the Mishnah. All right, would you like to read? Sure. Okay. A, a grown-up man that has relations with an underage girl, two, an underage boy that has had relations with an, with an adult woman, and three, a woman injured by a piece of wood. Their marriage contracts are worth 200 zoos. What is zoos? A zoos is a uh, currency of ancient times. Okay. okay. I was trying to look up uh, what its modern day value would be. There's different methodologies of doing that, but it, okay. it gets you nowhere. Okay, cool. According to Rob Meir, the sages disagree concerning the woman injured with uh, injured by a piece of wood. Her marriage contract is only worth a money. Man, okay, man that's, that's like I think that's a half a zoos. Okay, okay, gotcha. And she cannot claim virginity. A convert, a captive, a servant, uh, a servant who is redeemed, converted, or released, uh, released past the age of three years and a day, their marriage contracts are worth a mana. Uh, money, how do you say that? A money. Money. Uh, money, and they cannot claim virginity. Okay, <clears throat> so the whole uh, tractate, Ketubot, has <clears throat> one subject on its mind. It's a Ketuba. Now, for those of you who do not know what Ketuba is, Ketuba literally means uh, writing. It comes from the root word of Ketav, okay? It is the marriage uh, marriage contract that is signed between a husband and wife. And basically, this is what a ketubah is. If a man divorces his wife, he owes her post-marriage fees. What's that called in, in modern day law? Um, um, alimony or something. Right, he has, to, <clears throat> he has to pay her payments uh, because he was her, her main support. And now that she's no longer married with him, she, she has to get a paycheck from him. And so in Jewish law, uh, there's a difference between a virgin and a non-virgin. Um, a virgin, since it's her first marriage, or supposed to be her first marriage, uh, is supposed to get 200 zoos on her contract. Okay, so if she happens to get divorced, God forbid, uh, her, her ex-husband now owes her 200 zoos. Okay. Uh, now, non-virgins, since it's supposed to be their second or third marriage, uh, God forbid, mm -hmm. uh, they only get a contract that's up to uh, to half. a money. So basically, half uh, a half roughly. of zoos, I do believe that is. Okay. Uh, which is not very much at all. Okay. Now, these are halakhic minimums. If the husband wants to do way more than that, he can. Right. 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 So, so that's the context. It's talking about what will be the Ketubah's value, okay? So the Gemara, uh, wait, let me explain some things. So um, an underage girl who gets, has sexual relationships somehow, okay? So notice that the, uh, it's not talking about what should happen or the ideal. You know, the Talmud is a book of law. It is a, um, going to talk about different situations. So the little girl who, God forbid, has somehow had uh, sexual relations as a minor, uh, she can still get the 200 uh, zoos contract because she was underage. And then uh, also a woman who did not lose her virginity through sexual means, rather that somehow her, uh, she got damaged by being hit by a wood, wood stick or something like that. Uh, she can also claim 200 uh, zoos, according to Rabbi Meir. The sages say that once a woman's been damaged in the, the nether parts, uh, that it's too late to prove anything from it. Because here's, here's what happened normally, is, is it, it has to do with, uh, with uh, the blood on the marriage bed. Mm -hmm. it, that's the sign right. of virginity, okay? And uh, I know this is starting to get a little graphic, right, for a broadcast, but uh, it's very important because these are really tough claims sure, sure. against the Talmud. And so uh, once a woman is, like, damaged somehow and now she bleeds um, below due to the uh, being hit by an, uh, a wood or falling from a tree or whatever it may be or riding on a horse, uh, a horse too hard, uh, 
So since she has trouble proving her virginity, uh, that's where the debate is. Rabbi Meir says she can get the 200, and the rabbis say, well, since there's no evidence of her virginity anymore, she can only get a, a mane mm. instead. Okay, so now let's look at the Gemara, where our statement is. Okay, Rava said it means this. An adult that has relations with an underage girl is nothing. It is as if he poked her eye with a finger. And an underage boy that has relations with an adult woman has made her as if she was injured by a piece of wood. The difference of opinion between Rabbi Meir and the sages is in concerns to the latter if she is indeed considered as if injured by wood. Meaning this, so this is all it's saying. When someone has illicit relations with someone less than the age of three, it does not affect her virginity. Right. So this statement so it's not is actually protect, protecting her. So it's not protecting the man, it's protecting the little girl. Right, so that she can right. get 200 uh, zoos on her ketubah as a minimum. Right. So right. it's protecting her. So it's saying, uh, because just because someone, God forbid, raped her, or if right. she was somehow seduced into something that she didn't understand, uh, because she's less than the age of three, mm -hmm. then we consider that as she has not lost her virginity. Right, right, okay, gotcha. and it has to do with the healing aspect of a young toddler's body. Gotcha. So, is that clarified or is it not 100% clear? No, I think it was, it's probably clear to me because I've gone over it with you several times and I've heard other rabbis talk about it too, so. Uh, but if you guys have any questions that you'd like to have answered, you can put them right there on the YouTube chat uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring those in before we switch topics or uh, we'll try to double back if we can. So, uh, but yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, ultimately, like I said, the claim is that um, that the whole thing is it gives any man permission to violate a young child, and that's just a, that's really ridiculous. It's absolutely abhorrent, and so it's in, as you mentioned before in the previous things that we read, it's, it's completely forbidden for these things to take place. But in the case that it does, Chasam Shalom, then this girl is protected. God's power and his his edict says she is. She is totally protected. So, Rukashem. There was one word missing from that whole passage. The word mutar. And mutar in Hebrew means allowed. It didn't say that it's allowed to do that. Right, right, right. The Talmud has to bring up hard cases so that the rabbis know what to do when the time comes that these right. things happen. The what ifs. So it's, and, it, and it's a horrible, unfathomable thing that someone under the age of three would have relations like that. But the Talmud has to bring it forth and say, well, what do we do now with your ketubah? Okay, did she lose her virginity or not? The rabbis, <laughs> I think it's a very progressive mm -hmm. view, say, no, she did not lose her virginity. It is nothing. That's what it means. It is nothing to her ketubah. Gotcha. So okay. Well, that cool. was one of the ones that you called me on. Right, so. right. Which was the first one that this friend of mine had actually charged against it. So. All right, so now. All right, moving on. Now, did you know that the Talmud says that if you want to do evil, you have to go to a faraway place and do it? <gasps> or you can do evil as long as you go to a faraway place and do it. It's a permission. You can do this. Yeah. Well, let's see what the Talmud actually says. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, William. Okay. Our sages taught Arav Eli. Eli. Yeah. E oh, Eli says that if a man sees that his evil inclination is overtaking him, and he, sh uh, he should go to a place where people do not recognize him. He should wear black clothing and wrap himself in black. He should then do whatever his heart desires and not desecrate the name of heaven. Okay, so let's unwrap this a little bit, okay? Uh, Rabbi Eli says that if a man's evil inclination is overtaking him, it didn't say evil. Do you notice that? You see, the anti-Semites, um, the anti-Semites are saying that Jews do evil in faraway places. What does it actually say here? Right. Evil inclination. Right. What right, is right. what is the evil inclination normally talking about? It's your heart, your your flesh, your your just personal desires. Yeah. What the New right. Testament would consider carnal desires. Right, right. 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 Okay. So it's not talking about murder. Okay. Right. And it's not talking about doing uh, some other sin like that. It's talking about probably sexual things. Mm -hmm. All right. And even if it was talking about murder, let's see what it says. 
go to a far away place. Right. Why? Because it will take time until you get there. Mm, nice. And that gives you time That's a good point. to rethink your actions. All right? So if you're in the moment and you feel like your evil inclination is really getting to you, you feel like you want to get that carnal stuff done, mm-hmm. one healing to that is a lot of time, a lot of patience. You know, uh, today we live in a world of instant gratification, right? If you want to do something, you can just look it up on the internet, mm-hmm. okay? And you right. can have it right then, right? The Talmud is giving sound psychological advice. It's saying, okay, first of all, start walking. Go to a faraway place. Start driving. Go far away. So if you're in, uh, in Austin, go to Dallas and do this. If you're in Austin, go to Houston. You know, that's a four-hour drive. That's a long time for something like this to die down. And then you're right. like, well, is it worth it to go all that way? Mm. Right, right, right. And then dress in black. That is code word in the Talmud for dress like uh, the Gentiles, okay? Uh, meaning that Jews had their own way of dress, style that made them distinguished from other people in the time of the Talmud, all right? So black clothing, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's black, uh, but it means... Figuratively. It just blend in with the environment. Right, right, right. And then, let's say he finally gets to that place, then he can do the action, And then notice what the Talmud says at the very end. And not desecrate the name of heaven. What does that mean? You see, when a Jewish person does a wrong thing, it reflects badly on God. When a Christian does something bad, it reflects badly on Jesus. Mm -hmm. When a Muslim does something bad and wrong, it reflects badly on Muhammad and Allah, Mm -hmm. right? Whenever an inherent to a religion does a bad act, it reflects badly on his religion and on his God. And so what it's saying here is if you're going to do your evil action. If you're bound and determined and nothing can turn you away from it. Right. Then then you better get, pardon the expression, get your butt as far away from you as you can. Don't let nobody witness it. Right. Right. Don't bring down the Jewish people right, with right, your immoral right. actions. Right. And don't bring down God. Blend in. Be like everyone else. I mean, could you imagine what people would think if they saw uh, Orthodox Jews in a strip club? Mm-hmm. What bad message that would give people? Right. They would think, oh, apparently Jewish people do this stuff, you know? Now, if, if it's some guy in jeans and a t-shirt and, you know, sitting there in a strip club, they're not going to know he's Jewish. Right, right. But if he was black hat and black, you know, suit and everything with no tie. Specifically it's, looking like, dressed like a Jew would be, right. Then, then he's not only doing the sin, he's bringing down the yeah. Jewish people with them. Right. Which is what the Talmud wants to prevent. And this has modern implications because, uh, I'll give you an example. I'm a, I, I, teach, uh, I teach school. And we have school shirts. Now, my district policy says that if I'm at a bar, something that is legal for me to do, Mm -hmm. I'm over the age of 21. I'm way past that. Okay. (laughs) All right. I can drink alcohol, and there's nothing immoral about drinking alcohol, and um, it's legal. And I can go to bars. So my district policy says that if I'm at a bar, I'm forbidden from wearing the school shirt. Right. Don't want to have association. Right. And they're not saying that it's wrong to do that. It says, you know, when you are representing the school, which is educating minors who are not allowed to drink alcohol, then you cannot wear the school shirt at a bar. And maybe that's because I would look like a student because I still look young, right? (laughs) Um, uh, And maybe they think that the student is uh, drinking alcohol or they'll think, oh, did you know that the teachers at such and such school drink a lot of alcohol? Right. Uh, Those kids must be tough. And yes, they are. But, uh, come on, that's supposed, <laughs> supposed to laugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm chuckling. I'm also thinking of another application I was thinking. You know, oh, yeah, please. Back when, when, I was, uh, when I was a Christian, I was big into witnessing and all this other stuff, but I still had my little moments of temptation. I always wore, you know, a cross around my neck and, and T-shirts, you know. And, uh, you know, there's a couple times when I had stopped at an un- unmentionable place and it was on my mind to do it, but people in town knew me. And I, was not, I wasn't stupid enough to, to go to a local place 
uh, nor did I want to blaspheme anything godly. So uh, I would I would put on a different shirt, get rid of the godly message, and then I took my took my cross inside my shirt so no one could see it. For that oh, very wow. reason, because I would never want somebody to look at this God follower, I'm going to say it that way, um, as someone who was immoral, you know, and that was a reality, you know, so a uh, similar situation, I guess. So the passage is not, you know, licensed to do evil right, right. or it's to like, be sexually immoral at all. It's right. just saying, don't bring down the, the Jewish people. All right, we have two questions on chat that I want to answer. Okay. Uh, to question one, where does the age of three come in? It wouldn't be the age of accountability. I agree. Uh, as we read before, that you know, it's about the age of twelve where you can marry off your daughter, right? Um, so let's clarify where the age of three came from. So going back to the Gemara there, okay. uh, it says that at the very end of the Mishnah, um, uh, a convert, a captive, and a servant who were redeemed, converted, or released past the age of three years. Okay. That's where the number three came from, meaning that uh, if if a um, if a child somehow, God forbid, has relations before the age of three, they can continue to claim virginity past the age of three into twelve. If something bad happens, she can no longer claim virginity anymore. She is still innocent of the claim of being uh, promiscuous, but she can no longer get the contract just in the same way that someone who's been injured by a piece of wood cannot make the claim. Okay, that's what it's saying. So, but the, but the question I think is more leading is to why is it that three years and one month, all of a sudden you're disqualified for, for having the level of protection and... Because the rabbis believed that the, the girl's hymen would heal itself. If she was under the age of three. So it's a scientific thing. It's a scientific oh, thing. Oh, so 36 months, if it gets injured before then, it can reheal. But after that, it's questionable at best. Yes. Oh, so there is an actual reason for it. Okay, right. cool. So it doesn't say that it's after three, it's okay to do this thing. It's just saying after three, scientifically, they really believe that that's the, that's the end of the hymen repair. So that makes perfect sense. All right. And the okay. second question Good. that he asked is... Why did the uh, Talmud uh, say uh, dress in black instead of just saying dress like the Gentiles? As I said, the Talmud is got all sorts of phrases and idioms and metaphors that everyone understands to mean. However, there is an alternative interpretation that the black is, is a dark color and that the person, when he puts on the black clothes, he is now going down into darkness in his action and therefore he's wearing black gotcha there is another interpretation to say that he's wearing what apparently Babylonians and I don't know the actual archaeological evidence for this um, the they actually wore black and so he's blending in in that way okay. so it's just kind of assuming how you know, if you wear black and white, you're either Amish or Orthodox, right? But that brings up a good point, though. Why not just say, dress like the Gentiles? Don't dress like a Jew. That would have been very easy to say. Is there... Because that's not, as I said, because then you get the other meaning of, you're now you're wearing black. You're you're going into darkness now right, gotcha. by what you're doing. Gotcha. And uh, so I guess we'll wear blue next time. And I'm going to predict the next... <laughs> I was going to predict the next question that's going to pop up is, why do, why do Orthodox Jews wear black now then? <laughs> oh, I mean, it all has to do with the times. Yeah, yeah right. Okay, right. so in the, you know, in the right. 18th century, that all changed. Uh, we have to apply what applied then to now. Okay, okay. right, right. So. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Carrying on. All right, I think those are great questions. Yeah. I appreciate that. Right on, right on. Uh, Good clarity. All right. So what about this story? Okay. Uh, it says that uh, there is not a whore in the world that the Talmudic sage Rabbi Elazar. Hmm. <laughs> What's so funny? I, I'm sorry. That just cracks me up. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how how, how ridiculous can this actually be? But anyway, well, it, I'm sure it makes sense based on something written. Well, but just because context. one rabbi does something That's doesn't funny. mean it's right. You right. know, it's not. I I forget the actual terminology. Um, about the Bible, they say it. The Bible is descriptive and not prescriptive. What does that mean? Just because the Bible tells a story where someone did something wrong doesn't mean that the Bible is condoning that action. Okay, so actually, when we read the full story, um, 
and let's do that now. Um, okay. Okay. Our sages said about him, about Rabbi Elazar ben Duria, that there wasn't a single prostitute in the world that he didn't have intercourse with. Oh, by the way, why isn't the claim against the Bible where Judah had sex with Tamar, who he thought was a prostitute? See, you can make the same claim against the Bible, all right? Now, the Bible is not saying that that's the right thing to do, that Judah did the right thing. It's just something Judah did, it was wrong, and the Bible records it. Same thing here. This rabbi also had lots of sex with prostitutes, and the Bible, uh, the Talmud is recording that. So, uh, so he had, he's had sex. So will you, Elazar Vendoria, will never be received when you repent. Hmm. And this moment caused a paradigm shift in this rabbi. Because in the next passage after that, the one they forgot to quote, it says, He went and sat between two mountains and hills. He said to the mountains and hills, Ask for mercies on my behalf. Okay. Uh, they said, the mountains and hills they said to him how can we ask on your behalf for mercies when we must ask mercies on our behalf as it says in Isaiah 54 verse 10 the mountains will be moved and the hills will falter okay now do you remember last time what I said is a general rule to do whenever the Talmud quotes scripture the rule is this you have to open it up to that scripture to see the full context of it. Actually, you'll get a really great gem from opening it up. Okay, so he's, the mountains and hills are saying, well, we have to ask for repentance of our own because it says in Isaiah 54, verse 10, okay, which we're going to bring up here in the Bible. Okay, got it. Hold on a second. Um, it says, uh, for the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed. Okay, that's what he, the mountains and hills just said. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that hath mercy on you. So basically the mountains are saying, hey, we, are gonna, we will be destroyed in the end. But God's covenant with you, a human being, will continue to be a covenant of mercy. So don't ask us the hills and the and the and the mountains. Okay, so since the hills and the mountains now refuse, he then says in the next passage, "Heavens and earth, ask for mercies on my behalf." <laughs> they said, "How can we ask on your behalf when we must ask mercies on our behalf?" As it says in Isaiah 51 verse 6, the heavens will vanish like smoke, and the earth will grow old like a garment. Okay, so the earth and heavens are like, man, we got to pray for ourselves. How can we pray for you, right? Uh, and so that's Isaiah 51 verse 6. So let's look that up now. Okay, Isaiah okay. 51 6. Okay, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. Okay, another key point here. 
what the prostitute said about you not being able to repent and being accepted by God anymore, you went too far, is wrong. No, salvation is forever. All right, so he tried the heavens and the earth. Next thing he's going to ask is the sun and moon. Sun and moon, ask for mercies on my behalf. They said, how can we ask on your behalf when we must ask mercies on our behalf? For it says in Isaiah 24, verse 23, then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. Uh, they're saying no sound. That was a little while ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, That's what I've been working on. Oh, okay, great. All right, sorry. I uh, wonder what happened. Um, so anyway, so he, now he's asking the sun and moon, uh, ask for mercies on our behalf. Uh, they're saying, we can't ask for your, on your behalf. We also will fade away one day, according to Isaiah. Notice that all the quotations are from Isaiah. Um, the next one is, I'm going to skip that Bible verse because it's similar. Um, he said, stars and constellations, ask for mercies on my behalf. They said, how can we ask on your behalf when we must ask mercies on our behalf? As it says in Isaiah 34, verse 4, all the host of heaven will dissolve. So now he's run out of options. He's asked the hills and the mountains, the sun and the moon, the stars, the sky. He's asked everything inanimate possible. And this is his moment of realization at the end of the story. He said, well, I guess the matter doesn't depend on them, rather me. Now he knows where the repentance must come from. It's not about asking all these things for asking mercies on him. He himself must repent. He placed his head between his legs and cried so hard that his soul departed from him. A voice from heaven declared, Rabbi Elazar ben Doria is now invited to the world to come. So that's it. The story is correct, yes. Rabbi Elazar did have relations with a lot of prostitutes in his day, but the story is one of repentance. He repents at the end of the story, but the anti-Semites who quote this story forgot to mention that fact. So. Okay. Gotcha. Clear? Yep. Beautiful. Carrying on. Yeah, somebody said they couldn't hear us, but I th I'm not sure why. Uh, it didn't change anything. So might have been a, uh, a flux of some kind. So Maybe okay. it's the particular camera view that's it, not well, having sound? It, I'm thinking it may actually be something that has to do with the desktop presenter. Uh, oh, okay. Like with the Bible, it's got the capture audio. I so see. that one I turned off because I think when it's trying to capture that, it may mute our microphones a little bit. So we'll see. All right. Okay, good. Okay, cool. So next one. All right, this is the last claim. Okay. And then we'll open up the phone lines for any questions. Okay. Uh, so what is this about um, a woman who had intercourse with a beast is eligible to marry a Jewish priest? Um, a woman who has had sex with a demon is also eligible to marry a Jewish priest. So priest, unlike all other... Now this is the claim. That's the claim, yeah. Claim, not the quote. Okay, got it. It's not a quote, but it's the quote is very close to it. Okay. Okay, to be honest. Okay. And But the thing is, they, forget, they always forget to quote the next passage, which explains mm -hmm. it. Right. So so here's the thing. Priest, in, in Jewish priest, Kohanim, have a rule that they can only marry virgins. Okay, that's a rule. Right. The high priest, even more so, uh, he can't... They can only marry virgins. I think priests can marry um, widows, but the high priest has to marry an absolute virgin, mm -hmm. all right, which is the uh, subject of Ketubot and Nisuin and all these Talmudic tractates. Uh, so here's the thing is what if the pers this woman had a bestiality, which, by the way, bestiality, absolutely forbidden in Judaism, absolutely forbidden in the Torah. Rambam listed as one of the prohibitions for anyone to have sexual relations with an animal. Even an Anju. And then, mm -hmm. what's up? Even even an Anju. Noahide laws as well, right? Oh, a Noahide yeah. cannot have right. bestiality right. either. For it's sure complete, not. Completely forbidden. Completely forbidden for everybody. Right. And uh, so the question is, is what happens when this happens? Are they still eligible for the priest? So let's look at the Talmudic passage. Um, and when you see it in this context, it's probably not what you think it means. Um, Rabbi Shimon bar says, She that has intercourse with an animal is nonetheless fit to be married to be a, uh, to a priest. Okay? Um, the rabbis taught also, She that has intercourse with that which is no man, 
okay, so that must be the demon that they're talking about, is fit to marry a priest, even though she is eligible for stoning. Wow. So the Talmud right there is saying that both of these cases, you are for eligible stoning. for stoning. Right, right. Okay. Now, what if in the situation that you get uh, acquitted by a court, okay, and you're still guilty of the sin? Well, because you haven't technically lost your virginity necessarily, then you are eligible to marry a priest. But the one with about the bestiality is a little weird because actually the next passage um, explains w really what the context is. And he gives a story that, that explains it. He says, Rabbi Dimi, I like how Dimi rhymes with Shimi. It's like, what are they, like cousins or something? <laughs> hey, this is my cousin Shimi, and oh, it's my cousin Dimi. No. So Dimi came and explained the incident which happened in Italu, okay, it's somewhere in Babylon. A priest. Okay. So the passage is not really even talking about actual bestiality at all. Right. I think from the context. Right. So that's it. That's all I had prepared for today. Interesting. That was very cool. So the phone lines, uh, 855-952-4253, are officially open as we speak. Uh, if you want to call in, uh, that will be, actually, it will be in about two seconds. Very good. And I'll put that on your screen now. So uh, we've got a few uh, a few comments up there. If you want to see if anything might need to be clarified, go for it. And there's your phone line on the screen now. So yeah, someone made a comment. They said uh, Judaism is different, uh, but in Islam, Christianity, chastity is very important. I, you see, I don't I don't agree with that 100 percent because in Judaism, if you actually get to a real uh, Orthodox Jew that's strict they won't even touch women right you can't shake their you, you won't even shake their hand i made the mistake <laughs> i gotta tell you this i was at my friend's wedding uh jewish wedding in california and uh I'm, I'm he introduced me to his to his wife and uh and i was like oh and they're orthodox jews and uh and i was like i was shaking guys hands and i was like oh hi it's nice to meet you and i reached out and her hand was kind of there and when i grew when i <laughs> when i shook her hand she would shake my hand like you're like she was kind of like uh, yeah, and then a, a few seconds later, she goes, "Oh, it's, it's it's not permissible for you know whatever." And I was like, "I had no clue." I mean, they really are very very modest, about as modest as you can get. So, in agreement with what I've experienced, exactly the same. A true Orthodox religious Jew is absolutely above above the standard, like you would not imagine. And it's you're amazing. not even allowed to be in a room alone with a girl that right, you're not married right. to, right? Unless right. it's your sister or your mother or your aunt or someone yep. you're closely related to right you're not allowed to touch or uh be in the room with them right so to make the claim therefore that the talmud would say that you know bestiality is okay and and having sex with uh minors is okay and having sex with prostitutes is okay is absolutely that's good huh? completely out of context yeah. and has no basis whatsoever in truth about what the talmud actually right. teaches about these things very good. Same in Islamic tradition, there is a difference amongst the scholars of touching the hand of a woman. Inter right. Interesting. Well, even in Judaism, there are less radical factions of Orthodox Jews who will shake hands of women, but that is actually where they draw the line. That's it. They'll shake the hands because that's a uh, modern day. Right. Um, right. That's a modern day thing. Uh, they don't want to be disrespectful to women, and some women do expect their hands to be shaken. So here's the rule in Israel. If they you always let the women put out the first hand, and then you know. Oh, and, right. And if right. the woman decides cool. that I'm okay with shaking nice. hands with yeah, men, then cool. you can uh, shake her hand. Gotcha. Uh, otherwise, just assume that they don't. Gotcha. That's a good point. Good point. Cool. So. Well, good deal. Well, the phone hasn't rang, so I'm assuming it probably won't. Uh, yeah, so. there's like, who wants to ask a question to this <laughs> this idiot? Hey, you know, you know, <laughs> what's really funny is is this all these topics that we're discussing are 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 obviously very, 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 very contra controversial in 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 its in its ba in its sheer nature. Um, but these are these are questions that people have questions about. And but their answers that most people really don't even they don't feel comfortable discussing them, and so uh, out of the need to discuss them and to um, to put the, to put all the false claims at bay, like seriously, I mean enough childish nonsense. These have to be answered, and this is why the format uh, that we've chosen to do this in. So, um, and I'm just I'm thankful for you to be willing to actually do that as well. So, so um, yeah. Before we end, if you if you want to yep. end or not. 
Um, I just I, I learned that it's good to summarize everything in about two minutes. Okay. okay. And let's go back to all the accusations. Okay. I'm going to go one let's by one and remind everybody. That's perfect. Good. Why they are. And then summarize. And summarize it for everybody. That sounds good. Okay. So if there's one thing you learned today, um, a rabbi debates God and defeats him. Check in last week. You'll get the answer to that question. When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing in claims to her virginity and her marriage contract. So it's actually a law that's protecting her right to get the full 200 uh, zuzim on her uh, marriage contract. Okay? And it's a statement to protect her. And why three, not four, not five? Again, it's because of a scientific finding or belief that three years, oh, that's why it sounded kind of funny, three years old, uh, 36 months and younger, the hymen supposedly can reheal itself as if she was never violated to begin with. So four years old, not so much. So it's not like God didn't, respects a three-year-old but doesn't a four-year-old. It has nothing to do with that at all. There's, it has to do with absolute sound choices and reasoning specifically for those ages. And Moed Katan 17a, uh, if a Jew is tempted to do evil, that's not really what it said in the Talmud. It says if, it, if his evil inclination is getting at him, his carnal desires, he should go to a faraway place so that he will change his mind through the process, blend in with the rest of society so that he doesn't look Jewish, and do the thing there so that it doesn't bring down God and the Jewish people with his evil action. Mm -hmm. or that with makes his great sin. sense, right? Okay. Avodah Zarah 17a. Uh, yes, Rabbi Elazar had a lot of intercourse with prostitutes. They forgot to add the fact that he repented at the very end of the story and is welcomed into the world to come. Mm -hmm. Because you gotta remember, in Judaism, repentance is enough. Right, right, right. It's enough, and especially when his repentance, basically his distress was so tough that he died from his distress. Just the thought that he had sinned from God and had lost his world to come was enough for him to repent. And so what he went through is just like King David saying, I have sinned before the Lord. Mm -hmm. He says two words, Hatati la Hashem. I have sinned before the Lord. And he gets forbidden. He gets forgiven immediately. Right, right. And the same thing here in this story. This rabbi repents in the story. And then uh, 56b, uh, it's not really talking about bestiality. It's talking about, you know, an incident with an animal that might have caused her hymen to be broken. And... Uh, and it's forbidden to have bestiality and have sex with a demon. Okay, mm -hmm. it, it's it, they are both um, eligible for stoning, but uh, it does not affect their ability to marry a priest. Uh, of course, if they repent from their actions. Right. So. Right. Very good. Cool. Well, um, somebody had said, uh, I guess Mystery says, yeah, this is very informative. Hope the show sticks around. Oh, well, we know yeah. it'll go for at least seven more episodes. So. Right. Uh, maybe past that we'll see. <laughs> so, so next next topic, which w whenever it will be, it'll probably be more than a month from now. Uh, the next topic is what does the Talmud say about Gentiles? Because a lot of people think that the Talmud is anti-Gentile and anti-Goy, and that the Talmud would even say that it's okay to steal from them and do bad things to them. Hmm. So, <laughs> that will be dealt with next time. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And so. Uh, you might see some uh, pictures floating around uh, later on, maybe a month from now, of uh, Lon showing up with uh, Rabbi Singer in Israel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's headed up there in a couple days, and Rabbi Singer's going to be there till the 18th, so their, their paths are most likely going to pass. They going to cross, they're going to cross paths for sure. So thank you all for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to seeing you guys same time, same place next week. Shalom, Alechem, and Shabbat Tov, everyone. Take care. Shoo me, call her,